Good evening. Hi, Matt. Hi, Nate. Hi. <clears throat> the um, we should have Becky and um, one other person to have a quorum, but um, Rika can't make it. Greg may or may not make it, right? So it's Zoe, a new member. She'll be here. Mm. Um, and then we could do introductions and welcomes and then kind of talk planning for the next application round. Oh yeah, I guess I left my notepad somewhere else. I'll go grab that. Oh, hello. Is that Zoe? I think I think you're still on mute. Hi, how are you? Nice meeting you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Hi, welcome how are you? <laughs> are you definitely? Yes. Okay, because I'm about to go on live. And Becky is not muted. All right. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Zoe. Well, thank you. Thank nice you. to see everyone. Nice to be part of this. So we're waiting for two people. I'm just going to, I just need to pull up my um, my opening statement that I have to read. Yeah, Becky, I was, I was saying that Greg emailed me not too long ago and said he's not feeling good and Rika can't make it. So, oh, okay. So, we're not waiting for this. Might be it. Okay. Um, I'm just, you know what, Nate, for some reason, my um, my statement that I give has vanished from my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the gist of it. Yeah, the gist of it would be fine. Is that fine? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> then I will kick it off and just say that by the authority vested in us by Governor Maura Healy, we're holding this meeting by Zoom. Um, there was an act that was passed and that I believe she continued um, and that uh, gives us authority to have this meeting by Zoom. And so that's what we're going to do. And so with that, we'll start our meeting. Um, is there anybody in the waiting? Are there any anybody other than us, Nate? It doesn't. There's look one good. attendee right now. Attendee, okay. Yeah, I made you co-host, Becky. So you. Oh can. yeah, I see. Okay, great. Okay, um, so why don't we just do quick introductions, um, and then we can get started with um, with our new developments and and with the agenda, what's going on. So um, I'm Becky Michaels. I'm the chair of this um, of the advisory committee, and I believe this is my fourth year. Um, on the committee, um, my first full year, I think, as chair, or starting my first full year as chair, though I did some last year as well. Um, so Suzanne, I'll just move to you because you're in my in the order. Sure, Suzanne Schilling. Um, I'm starting my second year on the committee um, and glad to be here again. And Matt? Yes, um, I'm probably the oldest member on the committee, I guess now. Um, Longest serving. <laughs> probably both, but <laughs> uh, at least at least of these members. Uh, and um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to serve and get to meet a lot of very interesting other uh, fellow committee members. So it's been a good experience. Okay. So I'm going to... Yes. Um, hi, I'm Zoe Sulis. I was just recently appointed to the committee, so I'm looking forward to this work. Um, 
it's been you know part of you know Amherst for many many years so this is this is this feels really good you know being able to give back to the town you know that has uh, really offered a lot to us over the years oh, good thanks yeah I'm Nate Malloy I'm a planner with the town I help staff the committee and manage the block grant um, just a quick uh, housekeeping uh, Zoe did you get sworn in with the clerk have you um... yes I did yes yeah. Yeah. I think it, yeah. I I still have. I'm going to try to do that tomorrow. Oh. I, I know. I, I think to... I think I I still have a reminder somewhere. I need to do that yeah. too. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. I think I had a very tight time frame to get you know a lot of statements in you know and to be sworn in before you know accepting this. So I did this back in July. Oh, good. Yeah, we um, you know, we I was going to pull a meeting together in the fall, anyways. Uh, I didn't think we were going to have a block grant round uh, just because we had a we have a two year grant just starting. And so I thought we were going to have some time off before our next application, but we don't. So we're meeting the. Um, there is one vacancy on the committee. That was like one announcement. And I know the town manager is aware of it, but at this point, I'm not sure it will be filled. And I'm not sure it's necessary. <clears throat> we, you know, there's six members. If someone came on in the next month or two. I feel like it would be right in the middle of the process and it'd be hard to kind of jump in. So, I mean, we, you know, it may be filled. If not, I'm, I'm okay with waiting until after the application is due. It's not. Yeah, I think that may make sense. Um, I had the opportunity to, Nate and I met yesterday and went over kind of the upcoming timeline of this, of the grant, which we've just learned about. Um, and it's definitely a pretty tight timeline. So probably the more we can just launch in with, with just us, the better. Um, so I just have to say, it's so funny that we have like a Fort River group here. I think all of us are, are Fort River parents, right? <laughs> um, oh, Zoe, Zoe, also you are? Yes, correct. Oh, okay. what, what, what age are yours? Um, they're older now. They're all in college. I have, um, my oldest daughter is 22. She's a senior at UMass. And then the twins are just turned 20 and they are sophomores at UMass. Oh wow! Okay, so, uh, yeah, yeah. mine are, are seventeen to twenty-five. So yeah, it's been a few years since Fort River, but <laughs> yeah, I think for all of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. So um, just to kind of bring Zoe up to speed a little bit, um, and then um, we can kind of go into this where we're at now. Um, Zoe, in the past, the the block grants had always been done in an in a year cycle. Um, and then in the last round, we were received essentially double the funds and um, were um, in a position to give out two year grants. Um, it was the we had the it was the restrictions were the same and that we, as always, have are able to give to up to five social service agencies and up to three different non social service activities, but the amount of money was um, double the amount so it was intended to last for a two year period of time. Um, and then um, the assumption, as, as Nate mentioned before, was that we would then not really be in a position to be giving money out again for another year. Um, and so to do, be doing this process next fall for 2025, um, but instead, or for 2026, right? Because this goes, yes. To right, yeah. Yeah. Um, but instead, um, it turns out that we are being given the another round now. And so we're in a position where we have, um, there's going to be essentially a year overlap between the two year grant period and then the one we're gonna be deciding now um, where we can, we'll, we'll essentially go through the entire process um, that we will be going through and the same, organizations can apply for grants um, with some restrictions. And then we also have the opportunity to look at some of the organizations, obviously that last time we weren't able to give to because of the five, um, the cap on, on giving to five and think about giving to them as well. So it's kind of an exciting position to be in because I know um, at least speaking for myself, but I think probably for everybody, it's really hard to not be able to give to everyone because there's nobody who applies who isn't doing really important work. Um, so I'm excited at the at the idea of really feeling really good having given a lot of money to five organizations already and and having that in the back of our minds as we look to other people who to other other organizations that apply. Um, but the the sort of the bad news of that is that it was a sort of a sudden announcement, um, or at least I guess came to us. It sounds like fairly 
recently, Nate, right? With a, a pretty yeah. short timeline in terms of the um, the process of um, getting out, doing all of the, the required public meetings and public hearings, and then getting the RFP written and then out and then back and then reviewing it. Um, and we have to have everything in by, it's March 4th, is that right, Nate? Mm -hmm. Submitted. So we have between now and March 4th to do all of this work, which we often have um, a, a longer period of time for. Um, so what we're hoping to do in this meeting is go over what the schedule will look like and kind of a to-do list of what we need to get done every step of the way. And, um, and then essentially set up um, what will be or lay the framework for our next meeting, which will probably be a more a substantive and longer meeting where we really kind of dig into um, what the RFP looks like, what kinds of um, changes we may want to make to the to what we're looking for and, and um, asking applicants for. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess, um, you know what, Nate, I realize I'm just, I apologize for being disorganized on this. I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I may be going out of order, but um, Sure. Yeah. No. The next thing on the agenda was just an update on current activities. Okay. So maybe do you want to do that, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about next steps. Yeah. I'll say, Zoe, we can. Um, if you go to the town's website and you go to the block grant committee web page, so under boards and committees, CDBG advisory committee, we have all the grant years and funded activities on the sidebar menu, and we have documents from last year up there still. So the request for a proposal, we have to have a strategy. Um, and some other things. So that's all available still. The uh, Typically we have, you know, one to three grants active at the same time. So, we, you know, they overlap eventually because they can be extended. Uh, so right now we only have one active grant, really it's a 21 grant. Um, it, need, it typically would expire at the end of this calendar year. We have one activity, um, Hickory Ridge Trails. We're trying to get a trail through Hickory Ridge to connect East Hadley Road neighborhoods down to the Pomeroy Village intersection and uh, it's been taking longer just to get that uh, kind of permitted and design well, so i guess it's designed it's now permitting it's been a permitting for a while um there's some natural heritage and sensitive habitat there with endangered species <laughs> i was talking to becky about it. it's just it's kind of you know there's a, a turtle that's a federally endangered turtle so we have to be really careful of that and then there's freshwater mussels in the river that are also federally listed and so the towns met with wildlife and biologists, and now I guess they, we have to meet with um, muscle biologists to figure out uh, <laughs> the river. And it's it's, it's it's kind of funny because it was a golf course, right? And it was, you know, for years probably had worse chemicals and everything put in the water and the ground. And we're just using the existing bridge abutments and the bridges. We're actually letting most of it go wild. And so it's just strange that we have so much compliance to do, but um and then the 22 23 grant that becky alluded to the two-year one we're just getting that kicked off now so the state will say if you read any documents they say oh we'll apply in the spring and awards will be made in july but typically we don't get contracts out even from the state until september and activities don't start until october or november so the social services for the 22 23 grant started on november and um all the other activities won't probably start until the spring uh, and then with this new round, we're looking to apply for, we'll apply in March and then we'll get funding next fall. And yeah, so there's, it, it's, I, it's somewhat um, interesting that the two grants will be overlapping. And so typically we wouldn't have such an overlapping time period. And I've asked the state what that means for funding social services. And the catch there is typically you can't get two two grants in this for the same activity, unless it's an expanded activity. So, um, you know, it could be difficult for someone all of a sudden just to ramp up and say, oh yeah, well now we're gonna increase services substantially to show an expansion to apply for funding for this coming round. Uh, and we've had some emails back and forth and they haven't really decided how they'll, what they'll do on this. Um, so there might be some more guidance coming in the next month, but. So just just to give a concrete example, so for example, the uh, survival center has used CDBG funds for the um, uh, food pantry. So right. are you saying Nate that that they it'd be difficult for them to say, well, we're expanding 
the food pantry and, and getting funds for that, but it might be easier to, uh, for them to apply for a different activity that's not food pantry or? Right, right. So they could apply for something else or, you know, say for instance, with the food pantry, they're like, oh, well now we're giving, we're, you know, we're doing more vacations or camps or we're expanding hours and it's a demonstrable expansion. Um, you know, for instance, when Beck and I were talking about saying like big brother, big sister, we'll say, oh, we're doing 25 matches with block rent for the year. And it, an expanded activity might be like, it might be hard for them to say, oh, well, now we're going to try to do 40 because it's really just the same activity. And so I, you know, some of it is it's a little nuanced and I'd want to work with the state to determine what they mean by kind of that expanded activity. So, you know, like Center for New Americans, we teach, we support their classes that they teach, but they also do legal services and citizenship classes. Like for instance, they could apply for that. It's different. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure where that's going to land. Uh, and so it could be that we typically fund five social services. We don't have to. We could fund none. We could fund two, three, whatever. Five is the max. And we typically fund five. We've been doing that for years. But it could be that this year we we don't recommend five to the town manager. Um, we build up to the grant amount. So there's 825000 available to Amherst. There's a percent for admin, for staff, and personnel and things. But we build it up. So, you know, we have to you know, if we don't have enough activities, we can't apply for 825 if we don't have the money. So typically we don't have a problem with that, <laughs> but we do need to make sure we have enough activities to build the full amount. Um, and then, yeah, I think when I, I emailed the- Do you yeah. think, Nate, that you'll have a, a response back about the, really what it means to have a clear expansion of the program before we do have a the public hearing? I think so. Yeah. I mean, actually the program rep just emailed me today and said, let me know what you think about this. Like, you know, I think we're, I think it sounds like the state's still considering. So I, I'm, I might even just say, don't even um, like who not even have it be an expanded activity, because for instance, it could be that most of the programs we fund, we only fund a small portion of their budget. And so to me, it's like, well, you know, if we're funding 40% of a position at family outreach and they want to fund the other 60% next year, who cares? I mean, it's not like, you know, I think they're worried about supplanting and other things, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm considering writing and just saying, you know, could you be a little more flexible in terms of the expanded piece just because of this overlap? And I know some other communities are also considering this, like how does that, you know, there's other, you know, it's statewide. So how do you manage that? Um, yeah, obviously we want to be as crystal clear as we can right. um, so people aren't wasting time reading grants. Right. It will turn out just, we can't actually fund. And just like thinking out loud for a um, an agency that, that you know, in that example, if we're funding 40%, they want to fund another 40 to 60% or something. Wouldn't it be easier for them just in terms of record keeping and, and compliance and everything to have all the CDBG funds going to one activity and then using whatever other cash they have for other activities rather than splitting into two CDBG activities and have to do the compliance for both. It would, yeah. I mean, it's and it's almost like you're, you know, it's really redundant in terms of reporting and everything else too. So yeah, I, you know, it's just, I think the state's worried about supplanting. So I don't know if it's a state regulation or if it's just a, a guidance. They say typically, you know, you wouldn't fund a social service that received state or local funding within the last 12 months, unless it was, you know, already receiving funding or as an expansion. So, um, I, you know, I think there's, I think it's probably more of like an accounting principle, not like a, a CMR or a state law or anything. And so it might just be that uh, we could clarify how that could work this year with, you know, cause it is, it's a, it could be a 12 month overlap, 15 month overlap, which is pretty big. Um, yeah, so I think for now it doesn't, I don't think we have to worry about it. I think we can put out, you know, do our work and then um, get some guidance. You know, I was looking at the calendar last year, you know, the application was due at about the same time, but you know, the committee was meeting in the summer to start the outreach. And so I was gonna say that when I emailed you to schedule this meeting, I think I had just received the email the previous day saying that there's gonna be this next application round. So it really is a truncated process. And so, the state does want, you know, some public outreach to determine priorities and community needs. Uh, and then, you know, we we have to hold a public hearing on the community development strategy and also to try to get some public input. Uh, it has to be held two months before the application is submitted. 
And then we have to hold a second public hearing on the recommended activities for the grant. So, um, and then it takes a few weeks to actually put the full application together. So, you know, Becky and I went through dates and it really, you know, it's like, you know, there's not a lot of, um, <laughs> there's not a lot of room for, for missing or moving things by weeks. And so, I mean, one recommendation that uh, I'm a, you know, a number of communities met to talk about this, we might ask the state to see if they can push the deadline back, you know, six weeks or something just to give everyone a little bit more time, but I'm not sure that would happen. So I think, I think we should, you know, plan out, map out a schedule for the next three, four months, and then we could adjust accordingly, but I'm not, you know, even if they might push it back two weeks, I mean, I think six was a starting point knowing that we might negotiate to like three or four weeks, but. Um, so one of the things that we did last time, Zoe, just so you know, is we created a um, a survey to send out to the community and had it distributed like through COSA and through a lot of the um, or grantees um, asking community members what their priorities were in terms of funding. So giving some options and then giving an other category, but, you know, housing, youth services, mental health services, transportation, that sort of thing. Um, and we received back, I think, in the neighborhood of like 250 responses. Is that right, Nate, about that, I think? I forgot, yeah, yeah. Around there, um, maybe, maybe less. Um, and so we had talked last time around about um, figuring out how to get that survey out more broadly before we did the next round. But I think Nate and I, in our discussion yesterday, agreed that that's really not going to be possible given the truncated timeline but one of the things we thought we could do is before our um public hearing is actually advertise that a little bit more broadly and um and and also uh, create i think it was an online forum is that we called it nate where people could submit um their ideas and, and thoughts about priorities usually at the public hearings the primary people who are attend are representatives from you know executive directors from the organizations that are applying but if we sort of at least advertise a little bit more broadly that there's a way for community members and consumers to apply, to let us know their thoughts that we might get a little bit more feedback in that and we can um, send information out about that um, in the school newsletters um, in the COSA newsletter we can ask the organizations to put it into their own newsletters that they send out so that might give us at least some um, feedback from the community. I mean, in general, you know, the, the needs are also, you know, it's food and housing and, um, and you, I mean, all the things that we all, all know of, but it's, it's good to hear back if, if there are particular areas that, um, turn out to be the major priorities that, that people are writing about. Um, so we thought we would try to do that to kind of make up for not being able to do a more targeted survey, um, that would then come back to us that we could then analyze and look through and, and all of that. Um, and um, so that will be, so I think that sort of goes to, to Nate's point that we shouldn't assume that we're going to get extra time on the back end and should just kind of move forward, assuming that we have this, this short period of time. Um, so we talked about um, the having our next committee meeting um, be on November 28th and that that would be so the last week of November as an opportunity for us to look at the RFP and develop um, the um, strategy and, and the target areas and make sure that the RFP um, which we did rewrite recently so hopefully it will um, not need too much work but but have a look at it so we can all make sure that it, it says what we want it to say that we're including all of the areas that we want applicants to um, to write to write about in their grant applications um, and that that will give us and that the community outreach we can then we can start that now but we can sort of continue that past November 28th um, and then plan on having our public hearing where we you often hear back from organizations on about December 12th. Um, and the idea would be then that we would hope to get the RFP out on um, by December 15th. Um, with a do a return date from the organizations on, and I'm not able to read the number I wrote here. I think, did we say January 18th, Nate? Oh, we said 16th, I think we-, we I couldn't tell if I wrote a six or an eight. I think it was the 18th, and then we said the 16th. Okay, so I, I wrote both. 
and the idea, yeah. So if we just uh, pause for a second, um, I actually think I'll I'll go back and look at the survey that was done last year. To me, that's still a relevant, um, you know, planning document in terms of community priorities and need. I, I, I you know, the state wants us the, each community that applies to have they call it like meaningful public participation, um, which is fine. I just laugh because then they, I, I, to me, it's like oh, they think the priorities will change, but we often say, you know. You know how how much do some of these priorities change year to year? I mean, some of them are just kind of basic and fundamental, and so you know sometimes things might a little bit, but I feel like you know Amherst we try to have um, like you know we have anywhere from three to five kind of um, community service oriented priorities. We might have a priority for capital projects, whether that's you know like sidewalks or housing, and honestly that doesn't change much. Um, I think what what some communities might do is they really say that they only have one community service priority, like. A food pantry or you know something and then they only fund one activity um and we try to go a little bit broader than that um so i think that yeah like what becky said i think you know i'll work on updating the, com the committee's web page we can set up an online form through the town's website and if we you know get this information into the newsletters with um the schools and others soon we could advertise the december 12th public hearing and you know really as Becky said, you know, let people know that it's both for organizations and for community and for residents to provide comments on what they think are priorities. Uh, and then um, I just want to make sure that we'd have a quorum that night. So, you know, the dates every time we have a meeting. So the 20th of November, December 12th, you know, we need at least four committee members there. It's everything will be over Zoom for the foreseeable future. And then um, and then like Becky said, once we have this public hearing, we have an idea of what we'd like to do. We then try to get the request for proposals out that same week and then give people a month to respond with their proposals. Um, and then, you know, that it's not the best time of year, but the state, I think they're gonna stick with this kind of early spring deadline for towns to apply. So they had tried doing it in the summer or early fall. So then the process was a little different and I don't think the state like that actually just because of the way their fiscal year runs and so you know unless we uh, unless we knew this application round was happening in July then we could you know we can have more time and stretch things out a bit but knowing that we have you know we just received notice of it it puts a little pressure on um, on us and so you know block grant has to um, fund a majority low and moderate income individuals for services or, you know, capital projects. And so I was just going to share my screen. I don't know if I sent this out. I worked on it the other day. Um, and the state allows um, us to justify it using block groups. So outlined in yellow are um, our census, our block groups, and then the green uh, are income eligible where a majority of residents are considered low mod. And you can see the percentages just, you know, uh, as a label there. And so, um, so, you know, if we were doing a project somewhere that's not in green, we typically would have to do income surveys or justify it somehow that the end user was presumed to be low mod. Um, and then additionally, what we can see here, see in these outlines, there's this red outline here. This is kind of, we have to have target areas. And so we probably can't have any more than three. Uh, most places probably only have one or two, but we've had three target areas. So we have this town center target area, which is somewhat an odd shape to capture Olympia Drive and Olympia Oaks at one point, the East Amherst Village Center here, and then Pomeroy down here. And, you know, these can change the boundaries could change. We could flip-flop one. A target area is meant to be, you know, a geographic area in town that um, is eligible for block grant funding, but also a place where the town is doing other, other projects and other activities. So where we're either investing in development or, you know, there's private development happening. And so we've had these three target areas for a few years. And so, you know, the challenge in Amherst is that, you know, we couldn't propose a project in North Amherst say a public infrastructure project in North Amherst to do sidewalks on Summer Street, because one, it's not in, in an income eligible area and it's also not in a target area. And so if we did really wanna do a, a, a project in North Amherst, we'd, we'd wanna change it and make it a target area. And then we'd have to be able to somehow 
um, get enough information about the demographics to say it's a majority low mod. And so, you know, the tricky part is, um, is, is that actually. And so we've often fund housing projects with the housing authority or, you know, housing projects that are aimed specifically at low mod individuals. And that's easy. If we're doing sidewalks in some of these green areas, if the block group is a majority significantly low, lower moderate income, uh, you know, like 60 or 70%, then the state says, okay, sure, everyone within the walking distance is income eligible. And so they don't really question it too much, but it does leave, a, you know, there's a, a, a lot of area in town that isn't, and it's difficult to justify, say, public infrastructure or public parks or something in areas that aren't low mod. Um, but importantly, if we do get applications for those non-social service activities that are in any of those areas, if we are able to justify it, the target areas can be changed to match where we want to fund. So we're not- it, Yeah. It's so sort we, of an odd, like we have a target area, but we can change our target area so that- Right. It, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, for instance, in North Amherst, you know, especially around, um, Coles in this triangle, you know, there's the new library addition, there's work happening up here. I mean, we could say that there's a lot of things happening in North Amherst that would make it, could make it a target area. It's just, you know, because it's not in an income eligible block group, it's really hard to say what kind of capital project is there. Unless for instance, an affordable housing project or something came forward and really wanted to, to do something. Um, so anyways, yeah, this is, this this would be the map I'd put online showing, you know, what are the, you know, for now, the draft target areas and the income eligible areas. And, and Julie, I, just to clarify, you probably know this already, but I remember having questions about this early on. The target areas only apply to the non-social service activities. Right. So the infrastructure okay. projects in the town, that not not to the social service. No, that's correct. Okay. I get Make, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the social services, you know, they, you know, most of the activities have to um, complete a self-declaration form and they keep it on file. So someone will complete some demographic information as well as household size and income. And then they self-certify that they're, they, you know, that a majority of the beneficiaries or participants are low mod for a, for a social service activity. And so um, and that works out fine because some of the populations are presumed to be low mod by HUD. So if, you know, a food pantry, HUD assumes that users of a food pantry are probably, um, we still have to do the declaration form, but, um, you know, um, so most of the social services are pretty, they, you know, it's considered a, limit, a limited clientele that is majority lower moderate income. Um, you know, if, I was trying to think if there's one, if there's, you know, I'm trying to think of what if there's a social service, um, you know, well, for instance, if the senior, if there was a senior a service for seniors in Amherst, we'd have to, um, HUD has some, some information and we'd have to look at the census information and say that, you know, say the majority of, you know, 55 plus or whatever the target age would be in Amherst is low mod. And it might not be. So for instance, say there was a senior center proposal or some activity, we'd have to confirm that they were reaching a majority low mod because, HUD doesn't presume that just be, you're, because of age that you're a lower or moderate income household or individual. So, so um, going so um, the, our idea, um, the schedule as we're looking at um, is that the um, RFP would be due back on the 16th um, and that we would give our initial questions, um, we would turn those around by January 23rd. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's our opportunity for just if we have questions that we want to ask back to the um, to the applicants um, and they would give their responses by January 30th. Um, and we would have our first meeting um, which would be our first public meeting where we would talk about and um, and hopefully decide um, on the February 6th, I think, was that the date that you had down, Nate? Yeah, I said the 5th or the 6th, okay. so yeah. I... Um... We were focusing on Mondays and Tuesdays, everyone, just so you know, just because those are dates, the days of the week that work best for Nate and, and me, but if those really don't work for you, we can <coughs> try to have some flexibility. 
and it might take, I'll stop my share. It might take two meetings to do that. So <clears throat> the, what the committee has done in the last few years is, you know, we get proposals in, I'll get them out to you that hopefully that day. And then you have a week to review them and just generate questions. And then committee members send me the questions individually. I'll compile that and send it out to each applicant. And then as Becky noted, they'll have a week to respond. I'll get those back out to the committee members and then you'll meet on February 6th, you know, fifth or sixth to review those. And at that meeting, it's a public meeting. So applicants can be in attendance, but we're, we don't ask for presentations from them. It's really, uh, you know, I, I consider it like a working meeting with the committee trying to figure out how to prioritize and recommend the proposal. So the committee, you know, makes recommendations to the town manager and the town manager then ultimately decides what's what's included in the town's application to the state, but relies really heavily on the committee recommendations. And so I think we've been able to do it in one meeting, um, uh, you know, but I think we would, um, you know, hopefully we could do that. It might take a meeting or two. And then after we make those recommendations, it goes to the town manager. And then we have to hold a second public hearing at least two weeks before the application is due to um, receive comments on the recommended activities. And so we were thinking on February 13th would be another public hearing at which time uh, you know, the public would be uh, asked to comment on the recommended activities. It's also a public hearing to do any revisions to the community development strategy or target areas or whatever we need to do to make the application uh, ready. So the February 6th meeting is a long meeting. It I can be. It on your, I mean, we try to keep them to two hours um, max, but sometimes, um, you know, we like to give everybody an opportunity to all of any organizations that, that come to the meetings an opportunity to present what they want to present. Um, although we're pretty strict with, um, I think we give everybody about three minutes. Um, but then we also have a lot of discussion. So that tends to be a longer meeting. Yeah. And then usually, you know, it usually works out that we have review criteria. And so it becomes like a weighted review, a comparative review with each individual committee member. And um, we'll end up, uh, you know, again, setting those to me before the six. And so, or we can just talk about them. And it usually is that there's a few that are, say, higher priority or recommended. And then there's a few that really have to be discussed by the committee in terms of the social services and similarly for non-social service. And once we get through that, then typically the committee then looks at the budget uh, just because oftentimes there's more funding requested than is available. So then you have to decide how to allocate the budget. You know, is it is it a proportional allocation? Is it a ratio basis? You know, what? how do you recommend someone for funding if they have to get partial funding. And so that usually becomes a question. And we rely on Nat to do some some different financial- uh, Spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> Make some spreadsheets. Yeah, there's really no wrong answer, uh, but it is, it's it's an interesting thing because we've talked, the committee's talked about, um, you know, if it's just a proportional amount, someone could just, kn knowing that they could ask for more, thinking, well, the committee always gives me 70%, so I'm just gonna up my ask. Um, and so it's, it really becomes a kind of a, a deliberative discussion and, you know, in terms of, okay, well, what are there other um, sources of funding? Is it, you know, if you reduce funding so much, does it mean a certain position may not get funded at all, or could it be a halftime position instead of a three quarter position? And so, you know, that there's a little bit of, that could take a little bit of time to really negotiate that, uh, you know, and then, um, and then it, hopefully before the 13th, you know, the town manager reviews it and then and then on the 13th we have this public hearing for you know additional comments and then applications are due on March 4th so it's a it's a pretty quick timeline so for the next meeting um the one on the so is November 28th good for everybody who's here does that work yeah it'll work, it, yeah, it'll yeah. work. Um, so for that meeting, um, if everybody could take some time to look over the RFP, which is um, on the um, the, web, the committee website, and um, and think about any changes you'd want to make, um, any 
recommendations for whether they're new categories or new. I know in the last couple of years, we'd added in um, a question about um, race equity. I think we also added in um, information, asking for information about um, green, you know, how green the work is, if that's applicable. Um, so any, you know, sort of different um, pieces that we want the organizations to highlight and, and the non-social service organizations as well, if there's anything missing from there to look at that. Um, or, you know, likewise, if there's anything we don't want to look into anymore um, to, to shorten it. The application right now is um, a maximum of 10 pages. Um, although often people will give attachments, like an attachment of a budget, um, you know, or their, and they have to provide their um, org chart as well, which is always an attachment. And so those are not factored. Those aren't part of the, the 10 page count. Um, the, um, the target areas, um, I mean, we can spend some time talking about those, but I, I guess my recommendation would be that we wait and see what, um, what applications we get because it may be that they all fit right in there and we don't actually have to play around with anything we can just leave it as is and move on to the next topic um and um and then the other thing is to think about whether there's any other community outreach that we can do um or would like to try to do and that does remind me also nate you had mentioned that there was recently the age and dementia friendly survey that that right, was something yeah. we can take a look at because that talked i guess that survey also sort of um was uh, targeted in some, to some of the same um, people and also in the same kinds of topics, so we can take a look at that. Um, but if yeah, the, idea, yeah, there should be a, there should be a report on that too. That um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is working with the town, and so I, th I think it's finalized. It's probably through the senior center, um, so I can send that. Yeah, so for the twenty eighth, I, I can try to send around the responses for the survey from last year and the agent dementia friendly survey. The request for proposals we can look at, and I think we've 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 um, improved it. I think every year we strengthen the review criteria and also the submittal requirements, just so it's easier for the committee and also clear for applicants. Yeah. You know, we we have some formatting requirements and things like uh, Becky was saying. We added this page limit just so people aren't sending too much information. The state actually is pretty strict about what we submit. The town submits to them too, so the review. Uh, by the committee, you know, there's a comparative review and we have that criteria and it's actually what the state will use to then review and rank uh, the proposals on our end. So we, you know, it makes, easy, it makes our job easier as a community, as a town to submit our application because what we're asking applicants to submit just falls in line with how the state scores our application, but they're pretty strict about page limits as well. And so we're, we're mimicking that. Um, so anyways, a request for proposal, we have to submit the community development strategy every or every year now. It's a, I think they limit it to like a six page document that's supposed to summarize the community needs and then identify what activities are um, a priority. And so I'll send that out. I think it's also online, but you know, it might only need slight updates this year. The target area map, as Becky mentioned, I'll send that around that I just showed. It'll go online. I agree. I don't think we need to, you know, if we, I think those target areas are fine. If we, and if we need to change them a little bit because of activities that are requested, we can do that. Um, and then can in the you request. also send a, a, one of the blank rubrics that, oh, yeah. we, that yeah. we do just so that Zoe can get a sense of kind of what it is that, like what the scoring mm -hmm. sheet looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, we have this big table and we have like, you know, these categories here and across, and then you put you, I don't know if we do like one to three anymore. And, but what we, what it really gets to is a composite ranking um, across the activities for each member. And so I don't actually need to see your individual score sheet or anything. What we've asked people to do is just send me your rank order. So if you have, you know, one through seven, just send me your one through seven. Uh, and it can be with a note or two, like this one's really strong. And then, of the other committee members do that. And so then when we review them in February, I would just say, okay, you know, here's the the individual rankings of committee members. And it's like, oh, here's the top two activities that really seem, you know, that everyone agrees with. And and then here are the bottom few if if that's the case. And so then we just work that way. Um, but at least you have that, um, you know, you've gone through this kind of rational approach to review them. 
Yeah. And I found it helpful when I saw that for the first time, it just helped me at least sort of guide my thinking on mm -hmm. looking at the RFP and what it was that I'm reading for and comparing from one to the other. Um, so I found that really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, we usually put the schedule online. So if we like the meeting dates, I can get that online. And I, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and I think for outreach, uh, like Becky said, you know, we'll try to get through the schools and COSA and some others, but if there's other ideas, you know, you can send my, send me or Becky an email and we can, you know, figure out how to advertise. Um, you know, the idea would be to put everything on the committee webpage and that becomes where we direct people because everything is uploaded there and the schedule and everything. And um, sorry, Zoe, I feel like we keep throwing all this information at you, but one other thing um, is that because we are, that we are subject to the public um, meeting rules. And so we cannot email amongst ourselves. So if you ever do have questions or a comment, just send it to Nate and then he can email us to say, okay, what that is, what we very, that, yeah, that is an excellent, you know, yeah. yes, thank you. Yeah, and I guess the community development strategy, right? <laughs> I was just looking at the one we used last year. The state, you know, they want us, it's, I, this is why I think everything's so funny. They want like meaningful public participation. They give us very little time. And then we have to develop this strategy that's really supposed to encapsulate all the needs in the community, but it can only be three pages long. And so um, it used to be sick. I, I think when I first started doing this it was 12 pages. And then the, the state was like, gosh, this is probably too many strategies to read. So let's shorten it to six. And then I think last year they shortened it to three. And so, um, you know, I mean, they get, you know, they fund up to 50 or 60 communities. So it is, you know, they're probably trying to make their work a little easier. Uh, but so anyways, yeah, we have a three page strategy that could be updated a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, I've already emailed staff and I need to email some more people about just letting them know that this is happening just to try to get proposals, people ready, you know, thinking about it because it might be a surprise. Great, so um, is everybody clear? So the next meeting will be November 28th and then after that, the public hearing will be December 12th. Yeah. That's all good, okay, great. I, I think having all those dates ahead of time makes, you know, makes it a lot easier for us. We can yeah. table them in. Yep, so then- We can work are... around them. I don't know. So going down then um, in terms of the next, the meeting after that would be um, February, we're talking about February 6th. So it could also be February 5th if that works better for people. Anyway, May as well keep it 6th on the uh, yeah, same yeah. Tuesday schedule. And okay. then following that would be February 13th yep. for the final public hearing. Great. Okay, great. All right, terrific. Um, and, then, and then we'll communicate that out to those who are not here tonight. Yes. Yep. Great. Um, and Nate, is that, does that cover everything? I feel like uh, let me see the tonight. agenda. You know, we reviewed the current activities. We discussed the, oh yeah. I, um, um, you know, I, one of the, one agenda was discussed the 22, 23 grant startup. And so, you know, we've just started the social service contracts. I was going to do um, a startup meeting with them. So typically we have a startup meeting. We try to do a mid meeting and an end meeting. And I guess, you know, committee members are always welcome to attend. Um, I, you know, we could always have site visits uh, after they get started. But you know we are. I am getting those um, social services up and running, and like I mentioned, the other activities are you know construction based and won't happen to the spring. I have to get some environmental clearances done before we can submit our current our twenty four application or this current round of applications. So I have a little bit of work to do because um, some of the activities are near you know rivers and other environmental things. <laughs> So the uh, it takes a little bit of, of time. We have to do local and then federal um, review. And so our local doesn't have to be done, but I have to clear everything federally to get started. And so, um, you know, for instance, one of the activities is adding sidewalks on Route 9 in East Amherst from the inter intersection near Cumbies down to like Stanley Street. So um, down by Colonial Village and Alpine Commons. And the project itself is pretty big, but because it goes to the river, it stops at the bridge. I just have, you know, when we're within riverfront, I have to, you know, follow these this, these federal steps, um, which takes, I think, like two months. 
So I'm trying to get that started. Um, but the grant seems like it should be fine. We're funding Valley CDC with micro enterprise assistance. You know, we have five social services and then we have some infrastructure. And, you know, one thing I was gonna do as well, I mean, we have, um, I was gonna send an email with uh, the previous recipients of the grants. We have one and we can just keep that going. So it helps with the review to see who's been funded in the last few years. So I can get that up out there too. But I think for the current round, you know, I told Becky Valley CDC might submit something for a capital or non-social service activity. The town has an idea or two, uh, but you know, it is not a lot of time for someone to come up with a project idea and then have plans or a budget. And so I, you know, I'm hope, you know, I'm assuming we can build up to the 825, but it is, it's, it's, you know, really not a lot of time for someone to, you know, put a whole product together. Um, what else is on the agenda? I think the 24 application, we've discussed everything. There's still one person in the audience if we wanted public comment. Um, I don't have anything that's unanticipated. So yeah, if she, yep, it looks like Lev is raising her hand. So Hi Lev, you can unmute yourself. Thanks so much. Um, I'm always curious if other people are in the audience. Um, <laughs> but um, thanks so much for all of this information. I really appreciate the committee's work and planning on this. I am wondering if you can say a little bit more about what you're anticipating in terms of the eligibility for currently funded programs, a clear expansion, um, how that will work. And my sort of follow-up question to that was it sounded like Nate at one point you were suggesting that there may be some types of programs that would be presumed to serve income eligible populations and thus wouldn't require individual income eligibility. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about that if you um, can share. Thank you so much. Sure, I'll start with your second um, comment. No, I, what I to clarify, there's um, HUD presumes you know a few populations are are low mod, and so you just have to do a declaration form or an intake form. And if if it's if it's not a presumed population, you actually have to do a lot more income documentation with each beneficiary. And so, um, you know, some social services they actually have to collect you know tax information you know, bank statements and other things to document income eligibility. But, you know, as a food pantry or um, English as second language classes, you know, those are two um, populations that HUD is presumed to be low mod. So the self-declaration form is sufficient for, you know, income eligibility documentation. That That's what I was saying. Um, does that clarify it, Lev? That definitely clarifies the second part. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. Can you for, clarify the first part in terms of expansion versus existing program? Um, and I guess to not to put too fine a point on it, but my question comes up with um, where the Amherst Survival Center is very grateful to receive current um, CDBG funding to support the food pantry. However, current funding is nowhere close to meeting the need in terms of supporting Amherst residents. But our proposal for this year project like outlines all components of the food pantry, not really which specific component CDBG is funding. So I guess I'm just curious if you could say more about that, if there would be an opportunity we could potentially even adjust the scope of the two year proposal to have then some other piece or um, that I, um, yes, I would love to hear your thoughts or what you feel like that means in terms of existing projects versus expansions. Yeah, I mean, the state has that in there because they're worried about supplanting. So, um, you know, typically if you receive state or local funding, uh, you can't then, you know, use new block grant money to then put those funds somewhere else. And so when we ask an applicant to apply and we submit it to the state, we have to have a full program budget to show you know, if, 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 you know, if it's a hundred thousand and block grants paying 40, where's the other 60 coming from? And so basically the, the block grant program knows or sees that the program has a full, um, 
a full budget. And I think, you know, the what's the concern there is if it's not an expansion and then you get funding for the same activity, a second um, bit of funding, say another grant year, that then you're displacing state or local funds and it could be a supplanting issue. And so, um, you know, there's probably ways to show that it isn't, but I think it, you know, it's a, um, it's probably going to be specific to each organization. So if, for instance, uh, you know, the survival center can show that there's a lot of private donations or something that's not a um, state or local as in a town funding, then it's not a supplanting issue. But for instance, um, say Center for New Americans gets, you know, um, Department of Early and Secondary Education funding, and then they are applying again, and there's and it's like it looks like that we're just now they're going to push off their DESE funding to do something else, and then fill that get, fill that with block grant money. That's actually supplanting, and so you know, and that's that's a that's um that's actually like a federal regulation and state regulation that that can't happen, and so um, I think that's where the state's probably trying to figure out how they can allow activities that are funded with a 22, 23 grant to then also receive funding in this next round. I don't, you know, I think there's ways to. A, but it sounds like it's less about the program being the same program and more about appropriately demonstrating where the dollars are from so that there's no supplantation of either state or local government funding but if, for example, costs have increased because program use has increased um, and or other funding that was pending or projected at the time of the early, earlier CDBG application hasn't come through and there's no, it seems like it's not as much an issue of program as opposed to funding supplantation. Am I, is that accurate or am I misunderstanding you? No, it's both. So the, reg okay. the, way the regulations, work now it has to be a programmatic expansion um but i think uh we could for this coming round make the case that it could be a a funding you know if there's a funding gap or something that whether or not it's a programmatic expansion that it could be funded um, to have overlapping funding but the way the block grant regulations work now or the state program is it's a actually it's a it is a programmatic expansion and it might just be easier for them to do that than try to nuance every activity to see if it's supplanting so you know what their guidance document says is that it's, it has to be a clear programmatic expansion it's it's you know for the survival center and other organizations that consistently receive block grant money it's not an issue because even if you miss a year it's less than a year before you get next another round of funding so you never have you know, there's never an issue of, oh, somehow you backfilled your budget and now you're going to have a supplanting issue. But for instance, um, some organizations, uh, if they, you know, get some funding and then they miss a year or two and they apply again, and then, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're getting all this other state grants, but we don't want to do anything. We're not expanding our program. And now we're going to take block grant money and just, you know, like I said, move state money somewhere else. And so, I don't think the block grant program wants to look at each agency's budget in detail to determine if it's a planting. So the easy way to say that is it can only be funded if it's a programmatic expansion because then they know there has to be new money coming in to fund the expansion of the program. Um, so, but for this year, I think we could request that, like I said, that it, they look more detailed in terms of funding gaps in budgets and so that even if a program is not quote expanding their activity their services but their budget isn't um you know they're not having a supplanting issue then it could be funded and so that's that's what i'm going to recommend to the state and so it's going to be you know i don't know what how they'll how they'll view that thank you so much for all that additional context Right. Well, it's kind of like the five social services. The state does it, I think, just to keep their books easier to track. You know, I mean, I don't think there's a magic number there. Um, but. So it looks like um, Lev is the only attendee. Yes. Um, 
So did anybody have any other questions or comments? All right, great. Um, then we will receive some good information from Nate between now and the 28th, and um, we'll see everybody back on the 28th. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.